Hello and welcome to CACFP and Summer Feeding Procurement 101. So we're going to start talking about what procurement is and why it's needed. Um, we have more information in our manual. So if you have a copy of the manual or if not, you can go to our resource library. It is open for anybody to go out there. Um, you can get a copy of we have the regular CAC of P, uh, center manual. You'll find it on page 101. We have the adult day, which is AD on page 91. And we have an at risk manual. And you'll find our procurement section in on page 69. You can always go there to reference any information that you might find. And again, we always have, we keep a lot of resources into the uh, resource library, and we have a whole section just for procurement, so you can find all of that information there as well. So what is required to be procured? It is required that any product or service purchased with child nutrition funds must be procured using USDA guidelines. The reason for this is, is you are receiving federal dollars and um, any federal entity that receives federal dollars has to follow um, procurement practices by the federal government. Now, it's not just USDA, it's Department of Transportation, it's every anybody that gets federal dollars has to follow procurement. Now, we do have some special things with jet for child nutrition, um, but really, it, if, it doesn't matter what agency it is, it doesn't matter who it is. If you receive, we have to follow the same things because we get federal dollars. So you all have to follow the same guidelines. They just want to make sure that you're spending their funds and doing a good job spending federal dollars and being very cognizant of um, how you're spending that. So what is something that is unallowable? All goods and services purchased with child nutrition funds must be used by child nutrition um, or the price must be prorated based on uh, child nutrition use. So if you're not using it for child nutrition use, if you're not using it for the CACFP food program, um, then you can't spend CACFP dollars on it. So then a good example of this is maybe that you buy paper towels and you buy paper towels for the kitchen and for the bathroom, you have to prorate the cost. You cannot charge off to CACFP what is used in the bathroom because that is not a child nutrition expense. So purchasing in, the, in a procurement plan. So all purchasing transactions must be conducted in a manner providing full and open competition. Um, all CECFP institutions must have a written procedures for procurement transactions. We call this a procurement plan. We do have a procurement plan prototype in the manual and we have one in the resource library. We actually have two. Uh, most of you will use uh, this, the procurement plan for either a small center or just procurement plan. We have one that's called formal, and this is for our larger entities that spend over $250,000. Um, you will only need the smaller version. Very few entities will need the larger version. So um, use that procurement plan. Um, it has everything that is required by USDA. It has the methods of procurement. The code of conduct, minority for, for, minority firms, women's business enterprise, and labor surplus statement. We also need to have a chart of procedures when it does come to the procurement plan. You can create your own, but again, if you do, you have to make sure it covers all these entities. Again, we do have a prototype. Um, you can actually just copy the one from the manual if you would like. Um, but if you don't want to copy the manual, you can go to the resource library. We have it in Word. And in Word, you can add things to it if you need to. Um, this is an example of the chart of procedures. This is also required. Um, the chart of procedures is with the small one. The small procurement plan has about three pages to it. The chart of procedures is not inside that procurement plan. You have to print it out separately and fill it out. If you have the large one, it's about, so the one over $250,000, um, that one's about 12 pages long, 10 to 12 pages, and the chart of procedures is in there. So make sure you have a copy of the chart of procedures along with the procurement plan. So this is a kind of a really good example for CACFP. Um, all it is is the, where it says product, this is already filled out for you. Um, you and you just put your center name in there. Um, it says how often are price quotes obtained and you list how many times you either check prices or that you purchase those items. And then in the methods, you put how you do it and 
Most of you are going to be doing small purchase or micro purchasing, and we're going to be going through that. You can also do sometimes you see as needed and you can do micro purchasing slash small purchase because you may sometimes do micro purchasing and sometimes do small purchase. That would be my biggest tip for you is um, if you're only using small purchase and purchasing, which most of you are going to be doing. I would do as needed and then in the procurement method put micro purchasing slash small purchase. So on the written procurement plan again we have one available that you can use and it, that it meets all of our requirements. You do you do need to go in there are certain areas you have to fill out so do you make make sure you fill those out like putting your name in there you there's a couple of check marks that you have to fill out and um, the organization cannot go over the threshold and we'll talk about what the thresholds are for procurement. Um, you can always have a smaller threshold so when you're filling out the procurement plan just you'll check the box. Um, it will say the threshold and if you have a different threshold than the one that is allowable by USDA that is listed um, in the procurement plan and that we will be going over just click the other box and tell us what your smaller threshold is. We see this quite a bit, but when you're using our prototype, please do not mark anything out. Um, it, maybe you're doing more than what we have in ours. You can always type that in, but do not mark anything out. We have a lot of people that will mark sections out. They're like, well, we don't do this. What we see is you may be not doing it right now, but you might do it in the future. And if you mark it out and then you do that method, then you're not going to be in compliance and it'll be a finding. So just leave it as it is. Do not mark anything out. But again, if you are doing anything more in, in addition to what we're doing or what is states in the procurement plan, please, it's a Word document in the resource library. You can type that in of what you are doing. So we're going to talk about the methods of procurement. We have the informal method and then the formal method. We're really going to focus on the informal method today. Um, the formal method, again, many of you are not going to be doing this. I do have another training called the procurement process training, and it's about a two, two and a half hour training. And it goes through the entire process for procurement, but it also talks more about the formal methods. So the majority of you are going to be doing what we call micro purchasing. So what micro purchasing is, is it does allow you to make purchases. So anything that's um, um, a total per transaction that does not exceed $50,000. Um, that is what we call micro purchasing. Now, a lot of people just look at the dollar amount, and say like, that's what I'm doing. But that's not the case. It's just saying it's allowable if you don't spend over that amount. What micro purchasing is, is you're distributing the CACFP items among multiple qualified suppliers. So what that means is, is you're buying all your food and supplies from at least three stores or vendors. If you're only buying from one store, you are not doing micro purchasing. Micro purchasing is that you are buying from several different types of people. Um, an example of that is, is maybe you're buying your food from Walmart. You buy food from Crest, you buy your milk from Brahms, uh, you buy supplies from Amazon as well as Walmart. Um, maybe you're also buying um, your paper from Staples. You're spending all of your funds that you get from us for CACFP, you're spending them against a lot of different stores. So, and it doesn't have to be per month, it just has to be in, basically in a year time frame that you're spending it from multiple vendors. We have some people that only choose to, uh, to, um, buy from one and if you're not buying if you're only buying from one or two then you're not doing micro purchasing and we'll talk about what that is. Um, when you do micro purchasing you're not required to check prices or obtain price quotes um, all that you're doing is you're buying items it's at a reasonable cost but you're buying them from a lot of different sources. Um, and again, you must buy from a minimum of three different vendors or stores, at least per year um, and again it doesn't have to be per month just within a year that you're buying your items from different sources different places so again if you're doing using dollar general walmart crest Reesers. Brahms, um, if you're buying from multiple stores, that is what we call micro purchasing. Now, the last one that we really are going to dig deep into is small purchase procedures. And really, a lot of you are doing this. Now, this is allowable for purchases under $250,000 per bid or solicitation or, say, store. Um, so, again, a lot of you are going to be doing small purchase. I think you're going to be doing a mixture of small purchase and micro purchasing. 
What small purchase is, is that you obtain quotes or you're checking prices. And you can check prices by email, by phone, in person. Like if you're going to a grocery store, you can tell that this sweet Brahms prices are cheaper for milk than it is at Walmart. Um, that is what small purchase is, is that you're checking prices. When you check prices, you only have to check from at least two sources. So two different stores, two different vendors. Um, you do need to document some price quotes, um, especially if you're using a vendor. We need to know what documentation that you received or what you got. Um, it's not necessarily always the case at, for stores. Um, you don't, even with micro or with small purchase procedures, even though the place that you might be shopping from is not the lowest price, that's okay. You just have to tell us why you're shopping with them. Maybe you use a vendor and you sent out your specifications. Maybe you sent them out to Benny, Keith, and Cisco. And one, um, you got them both back and say, Benny, Keith is higher than Cisco, but you're going with Benny, Keith because they were able to deliver every week and not every two weeks, like Cisco said that they can do. So, it just because you with small purchase, even though if you don't go with the lowest vendor um, or the lowest person, that's okay. You just tell us why that you chose one over the other if it's not the lowest. If it's the lowest, you don't have to dog, you don't tell us why. We understand why because they were the cheaper price. But if you are going with somebody that is not the, che the cheapest, um, then just explain to us why. So if you purchase from one or two stores, you must do small purchase and you must check prices. So um, we have some people that only do shop at one or two stores. So if that's the case, you only have to check prices just around one time per year. Now we have this form and it's called checking local prices. Um, it is in the resource library under procurement. It is not in the manual. And this is an Excel document. So all that you have to do is you, like right here, they went to discount brochure and IGA. So all you have to do one time a year is just list like 15 products that you use and then go to the store and check prices between the two. It will do the math for you. So as we can see here, they did ground beef 80-20, a three pound roll. They checked prices between the to um, what it was at IGA. Um, also that you do, um, it's down here at the bottom is it lists what, so right here it says the day that you collected. You don't have to buy from the stores when you're checking prices. It's just on February 18th, they, they, somebody went to discount brochure and checked the prices on these items. And then on February 27th, someone went to IGA and checked the prices on those items. And they just put the price in of what it was, and then here's the totals. So they're pretty close, um, but say you choose to use discount grocer at the very bottom, it says if you're not using this store with the lowest price, why are you? Um, sometimes the reason why people only use one store is because of grocery pickup, grocery delivery. Um, just let us know that's why you're doing that is because that, you know, say gro discount grocer has grocery pickup and it saves us a lot of money in labor and not having to shop two hours a week. So um, it's okay that you shop from the, the one that's the most expensive. That is okay, but you just have to document to us um, either check prices. This is one way you can do it if you only want to shop from one or two stores. Again, you only do this um, one time per year. So again, just a kind of comparison between micro purchasing and small purchase is that a micro purchase, you're buying things from multiple vendors. You don't have to check prices, but you do have to buy from at least three different places, three different stores. Small purchase is when you do just check prices. If you're checking prices, you're automatically doing small purchase, even though those items might be just a $5 item. If you're checking prices, you're using small purchase. You just have to check prices between two different stores. Um, you do not have to go with the lowest price. You just tell us why you didn't. And then suggest, um, it, we really suggest you use small purchase when you buy from a vendor like Cisco, Benny Keith, U.S. Foods, Tinkersley, because that, the only way you can um, check prices is they have to send you prices back. Like anybody else, if you go to Walmart or Research, you're going there and you can look at the price yourself, but they have to send the prices to you. So you do need to at least check prices, send out your specifications or what we call a grocery list um, to at least two vendors. So now let's just briefly talk about what formal procurement is. It's required to do if your purchases are over $250,000 per bid or per solicitation. Um, and when we talk about bid or solicitation, we're talking about like for the year with a vendor um, or with a store or whoever that you're using. What's required is you send out specifications, also known as a kind of a grocery list. You have to send it to two vendors. 
you have to put an advertisement in the paper, you have to have a bid opening. It's just a bit much bit larger process. And um, there are two types of uh, formal procurement. We have invitation for bid or a sealed bid or a request for proposal. So again, I don't talk much about this just because so many of you are not doing it. But just to let you know, if you are spending over $250,000, there is a lot more procurement you have to do. Um, you can contact our office or contact your program specialist, and we can talk to you more about um, formal procurement. Most of the time that we see with formal procurement, the people that are doing it are like government entities um, or people that you already have a big process in place with formal procurement that already does meet USDA guidelines. With procurement, no matter the procurement that you're doing, it's required to maintain documentation to show how items were procured, either using small purchase or formal procurement. Uh, procurement documentation is required to be kept on file for three years plus your current year records, just like you would normally do with any child nutrition um, dollar amount and any child nutrition um, documentation. So let's talk about receipts and documentation. So it is required on CECFP that all receipts for items purchased, you have to keep those receipts. Um, we can only look at receipts for the month the item was purchased in. So um, again, it's a big deal. If you lose a receipt, um, we can't, you can, so what I would suggest if you lose a receipt. Um, so if you lose a receipt, say you had milk on that receipt, um, you, let's just say that you stated that you bought 50 gallons of milk that month, but you only have receipts for 30 gallons. We cannot accept that, we can't just take your word for it that you had 20 extra gallons of milk. We have to have receipts for it. I would highly suggest um, if you are missing any receipts, there's some places that you can go to, even like Walmart, you can, I think, pull it up with your credit card. Um, you can even go online on the app and pull information up with your credit card. So it, if you lose a receipt, there's a good possibility that from that store, you are able to obtain another one. So I would highly, highly suggest that, especially if there's a review. So if you're up for review and you notice that some receipts are missing, contact the store. Um, again, sometimes I think with the Walmart app, you can log in and it will tell you all your purchases, even if you did it in person. Um, so again, we can only look at receipts for the month the item was purchased in. When it comes to receipts and invoices, and we have to have a copy of the entire original receipt from the register. So if you go into the store, we have to have that receipt. Um, and it has to have a food purchasing form with that. Um, now, you cannot cut the bottom of, of that off or it will be unallowed. And again, we have to have the original. You can make a copy of it. We understand they fade, but we still must have the original even if it's faded. Um, one, some things that we cannot accept are any receipts that have been altered. If there's any receipts <clears throat> or invoices that does not have a date on it, we can't allow that because, again, we can only look at receipts from the month that you purchased it. And if you do um, grocery pickup or grocery delivery, and we have to have the final receipt. We can't have the receipt from when you submitted it or that is still in process. And I think a lot of you understand that because if you've been doing any grocery pickup or delivery, that just because what you order does not mean that's what you get. Either the store could be out of the item or they might substitute it. So we have to have the final receipt. Now, most of your receipts we're gonna look at, we can validate using your bank and credit card statements. But just again, make sure, if, again, if you ever lose any, try to go back to the store because a lot of times people have had a lot of success with getting a copy of that receipt from the store, especially if you know what card that you put it on. Um, just so you are aware, um, that with administrative labor and um, operating labor, when we do come out to do a review, we also will look at pay stubs. So we just want to be people aware um, that when you look, when if you charge off labor to CACFP, it has to be W-2 labor. We cannot accept uh, labor paid in cash bin or cash app unless you can show us that taxes have been paid. Um, if, if it's not W-2, if it's not W-2 labor, it's a 1099, which is contract work. What you're required to do is you have to make a contract, send it to our office, and then you have to go out on proper procurement procedures. You have to follow that. Um, but we have to approve the contract first. Then you go out on procurement. That's the only way that we can allow 1099 labor to be charged off the CACFP. So procurement's a really big thing, even if it's for labor, um, because with a contract, Again, you have to show us that you did proper procurement procedures. And again, you can follow small purchase 
or micro purchasing. And we can help with that process. If, the, if, if all your labor is 1099 and you want to charge off some of their labor because they are doing some CACFP work, maybe your cook is a 1099. Maybe your teachers are a 1099. Um, again, if that is contract labor. You're not paying taxes on that. So that's why you have to, at that point in time, create a contract. We have to approve it first before you can hire, before you can go out on bid. So um, again, these are just some little things that we want you to know about when it does come to procurement and labor. And as I mentioned before, we talked about receipts. Um, I have this in here just again, just again, just to reinforce um, that the receipts cannot be altered. Make sure you have them and that we will disallow um, if, if, it, if you do have a grocery pickup or grocery delivery. And um, these we understand like the ones with the original receipt when you're at the store, um, again, we have to have the original, even though it's faded and then a copy. Um, but we do understand with grocery pickup, grocery delivery, that you can print those out at any time. Um, I specifically had a center whenever I was in the field that the one reason she did grocery pickup, um, it was kind of a two reasons she did it is one is because the cook was older and it was hard for her to keep always load and unload the vehicle with all the food. So to do grocery pickup, they did it for her. And two, she was always losing her receipts. So if you have an issue being organized, I highly suggest you do grocery pickup or grocery delivery because that will, in case you lose any, you can always go back and print that out. Contracting for food service. Um, some of you might contract out for your food. So what that means is that every day they are bringing you food. Um, Every, so every day they're bringing you hot food and you just serve it out. So let's just say you have a contract with the school district. Um, so today they're giving you spaghetti, green beans, peaches, and milk. Um, and then they tell you how to serve that out. So that's what contracting for services are. If you contract for services, just so you are aware that you retain final administrative and financial responsibilities, you cannot contract for critical management functions, services that can be contracted, um, accounting services, data services, you can do anything like that for, that you're using for CACFP. Again, if you're going to contract for any service, you have to create a contract, send it to us, we have to approve it, and then you can go out on bid. Once, even with if you contract for labor or for services, once you make your selection, you have to send us a copy of the contract, and we do have to have a copy of that contract every year. It's the same thing if you contract for food service. If you contract for food service, most of you will be using the agreement to furnish food, um, ones with school or other entity. Um, so what you do is you print that agreement out, you send it to the school or you send it to your vendor, and then you send it back. And then we have to have a copy of it in our records. You keep a copy of it and we keep a copy of it as well. Um, so if you do contract with the school, um, the school is responsible for production records or the menu is their form. Um, but if you contract with a school or vendor, what they do is every day when they bring you the food, it has what we call a contract mill de delivery receipt. And on that contract mill delivery receipt, um, it shows you every item that they delivered and how to serve that out. You must, must keep those forms. That is your menu is their form. Now, if you do contract with the school, you have a little bit of cushion. In case you are missing a contract mill to deliver receipt, we are allowed to go to the school to see what they had on their menu. But if you use a vendor um, and if you're missing a, a menu as a contract mill delivery receipt form, then we will take that meal back because we don't have record of you having a meal that day. Um, what happens is, is so every day they bring you the food. And then um, at the end of the year, that school or vendor is going to bill you for the meals that they delivered. And then when after that, when they bill you, then you turn around and you uh, you file a claim with us for, to be reimbursed. Now, one thing we want to draw to your attention is if you are claiming meals, you have to when you claim meals, it has to be on those that consumed a meal, not how many meals were delivered. I have an example of this is I had a daycare center that had a contract with a school district. This daycare was licensed for 25. So every breakfast, they would always give them 25 meals. And then they would tell them at nine o'clock, call us and let us know how many kids you have for lunch. So in this case, they would send them 25 breakfast. And then for lunch, they were like, hey, we only have 18 kids here in attendance. Well, 
they're going to bill you for 25 breakfasts because that's how many ki- that's how many meals that they gave you. But you are only allowed to claim 18 meals because that's how many kids actually received a meal. So they will bill you for the meals that they gave to you, but you can only claim the actual meals that were eaten. You cannot claim over your, your uh, attendance. You can only claim meals that kids actually ate a meal. And this is a copy of the contract meal delivery receipt, just so you are aware what it looks like. So you should be keeping these for every single day and every single meal service that, you're, that whoever you use delivers your meal. That the school or the vendor needs to sign off on this. And then the person who made sure that you received everything also has to sign off. If you do contract with the school, just so that you are aware um, that schools are required to charge you a certain amount, it is set by USDA. So they have to, they have to um, charge you the free rate for everybody. So maybe you have 25 kids and you have, um, out of those 25 kids, you have 18 free and the rest are not eligible. Um, it is required that all 20, if you have 25 meals delivered to you, they have to charge every single meal at the free reimbursement rate. If you also contract with the school, you're required to get a contract with them for July 1 to June 30th. Now we understand the rates come out sometime in July, so you're not gonna get it necessarily July 1, you'll get it when the rates come out. But um, if you are contract with the school, we go by the school um, fiscal year, not by CACFP fiscal year, which is October 1. So if you are with the school, we need you to get a contract in July, not in October. And again, we have to have a copy of this contract every year. We have our original records. We have original um, pages. You can go to whatever manual that you have. You can go to the back and you can find some of these like the contract mail delivery seat. You can find those forms there. Some forms you're just gonna find in the procurement section. And then again, if you go to the resource library, um, you can go to the resource library and the procurement section and find a lot of forms there as well. So thank you guys so much for being with us today. Um, I hope this is a better understanding of procurement for CACFP and for summer feeding. Have a wonderful, wonderful year.